Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting with Stash, and this is episode 145 in the series. Welcome back to the Yarn Room. If you are coming back, it's lovely to see you. Thanks for coming to hang out with me on this weekend afternoon. Not sure when I'll post this, Saturday or Sunday, so we'll see. Uh, and if you're new, welcome to the podcast. This is a podcast primarily about garment design, knitting, modification, things like that. And in today's episode, I want to talk all about how I plan my sweaters. So if you're interested in sweater planning or if you've never started a sweater project before, this might be the episode for you. So we'll talk about my sweater plans. I have two in store, but I also have some sweater mending and care uh, thoughts for you. It's that springtime of the season where I often will take out my sweaters that I've been wearing over the winter and the fall, uh, mend them, wash them, you know, make sure that they're all good and then put them away for the summer. So this is actually one of the sweaters that I was working on earlier last week and I'll talk about that one. Uh, I also have a shop update for you. For those of you who don't know, uh, I run the Flock Farm Yarn Shop over at knittingthestash.com where I feature indie yarns from across the United States and I have a new one for you. So I think you'll be excited to hear about leaf livestock. So we'll talk about that. And of course I have a little bit of business at the end. I have a D-Stash update and a winner actually a couple winners for the flock farm yarn cow that we just finished up this past April. So for those of you who are new especially, uh, you can find me everywhere on the internet as Knitting the Stash. <laughs> Make it easy on you, right? So here on YouTube, over on Ravelry, Instagram, and on the website, which is knittingthestash.com. You can find classes with me over there, uh, the Flock Farm Yarn Shop, all the good stuff. So how about we start with that shop update. Uh, the Flock Farm Yarn Shop is lucky enough to have some new yarn and fiber in the shop. Uh, those of you who are signed up for the newsletter uh, already heard about this and I already sold, <laughs> I actually sold out of one of the fibers already. So I won't be able to show that one because it's all gone. Uh, but I have three different uh, spinning fibers. I have two kinds of yarn and all of these are from Leaf Livestock Wool Company and that is out of Illinois. It's run by Gordon and Ann Sammons and they primarily have a poly, poly pay flock. And we've talked about poly pays on here before uh, but the cool thing about their flock, they've had that flock since I think 96 or 97 if I'm remembering right, but they're also working on um, some natural color genetics for sheep so they have a cool mixed flock. Uh, uh, of a lot of different colors, different colored fleece. Uh, and I got a lot of yarn and fiber that picks up on that part of what they're doing. Uh, so like I said, they have polypay and then they've brought some merino in in the last couple of years. Uh, and some of the fiber I have is polypay, poly so, so hard to say, uh, Rambouillet and Columbia. Uh, so they have some really interesting blends going on. Uh, so first up is, uh, this is a three ply yarn. It's a DK weight. So it's about, uh, what does it say on here? 100 grams for 210 yards. Uh, beautiful three ply yarn in a gorgeous kind of chocolatey brown. I would say it's a like a light chocolatey brown. I think the camera will probably pick it up. Uh, this camera is pretty good at range. My old Canon was very bad and I always had to hold things up to the camera and see if it would focus, but this one seems pretty good. Uh, so this is a beautiful uh, chocolatey brown three ply DK weight. It's really squishy. And this is a blend of Rambouillet and Columbia. So it has Columbia. I always think of as a little bit more of a medium breed, uh, medium fleece. And then Rambouillet, I think of as a fine fleece. So when you combine the two, you get this really beautiful, elegant softness. So in addition to this three ply yarn, we also have a two ply yarn. And again, I sold a bunch of this when the newsletter went out, so I don't have as much in stock as, uh, as I once did. So uh, it's, it's moving fast, but this is a kind of deeper chocolatey brown. I think you can see the difference between these two. Like I said, this is the uh, lighter three ply. This is a slightly darker two ply yarn. Both of them are DK weight. Uh, this two ply yarn, put this one down so it makes it a little easier to see. The two ply yarn is uh, a mix of Rambouillet and Columbia, and it is 100 grams for 240 yards. I have some left in stock of this, but I did sell a bunch when the newsletter went out. So if you're interested, go check it out in the shop. And the super exciting part is that when Anne and I were talking, it turns out she just had some roving and top come back from the mill. 
and I got some of it for the shop. So we actually have fiber now in the Flock Farm Yarn Shop, uh, which is something that I think a bunch of you have asked for <laughs> a bunch of different times. Uh, so here are the two uh, rovings. Did I get that right? Yes, I grabbed the rovings. Uh, so one is a blend of Rambouillet and Columbia, just like the yarn. So if you like that yarn, this is a similar blend, Rambouillet and Columbia, roving, not top. So these fibers are not aligned like a top. Uh, they would spin up beautifully. If you wanted to spin them in a woolen style, they would also work just fine if you're doing like a worsted style uh, spin. Uh, this one, it's a little bit more of like, I wanna call this kind of a fawny color. It's a little bit gray, it's a little bit light brown. Uh, this is a polypay and Rambouillet blend, uh, and you can see it's just, oh, they're so fluffy and gorgeous. So each ball is two ounces, and in addition to the two rovings, I have one comb top left. The other comb top sold out completely. Uh, this one is a Rambouillet Columbia polypay hay blend. I really can't say that word today. And you can see it's a beautiful kind of light brown. Um, you can kind of see the difference between these two. That's why I want to say this one has a little brown in it. This is the roving, uh, but this has more of a chocolatey kind of brown to it. So this is the top. These two are the roving. And as a way of introducing Leaf Livestock to you all, uh, I love their little image, by the way. This is a postcard that uh, <laughs> Anne sent along with all the fiber. It's really adorable couple of beautiful multicolored sheep. Uh, but as a way of introducing leaf livestock to you, all, I want to do a giveaway. So I'm going to give away two bumps of fiber. Now these bumps are two ounces each. We're going to do both of the roving. So the kind of more of a fawny kind of gray over here and then the darker brown over here. Uh, I will do two, two winners. We'll pick two winners at random in a couple of weeks time. So uh, you can enter the, to win this giveaway by leaving a comment below. All I want to know is what kind of fiber would you like to see in the shop? <laughs> because since I'm going down this route, it might be fun to know what you'd like to see in the shop uh, from local or indie uh, farmers and shepherds from across the country. So if you leave me a comment here or over on the Ravelry thread or on the blog, you'll get entered to win in this giveaway. You can see all the fine print below in the comments. Uh, like I cover domestic shipping, but if you're an international winner, I'd appreciate it if you'd cover shipping, things like that. Uh, so two bumps of fiber, giveaway, leave your comment below. So that's leaf livestock. I have fiber in the shop. I'm so excited. It's beautiful fiber. Uh, the yarn is absolutely gorgeous. So I hope you'll all go over and support leaf livestock in the shop and check out their website. I will link to it below in the comments so you can check out Anne and Gordon's work with their polyplay, polypay flock and the work they're doing on natural colored sheep genetics, which is really fascinating. Uh, I'm trying, Anne and I are trying to coordinate our schedules so that we could do a Zoom interview and you can hear even more about leaf livestock stock. So look for that in May. I think we're going to be able to coordinate. This week I know is Maryland Sheep and Wool and I know Anne always has different projects going on and so do I. It's the end of the semester, grading and finishing and everything. So we're hoping, we're going to cross our fingers that we can get together for a Zoom and I'll put it up on the site so that you guys can hear an interview with Anne uh, a little bit more about her sheep and her work with Gordon and Leaf Livestock Wool Company. So as promised in this episode, I want to talk all about how I plan my sweater projects. This is something that I get a lot of questions about. And I think a lot of you who uh, especially are new to sweater knitting projects, you might wonder like, where do I get started? What do I do? How does, how does someone like you, me, plan a sweater project? So I have two sweaters that I'm planning to work on now that I've done my palette cleanse with a couple of knitted toys and a baby hats and a blanket, which I'm almost done with. Uh, and the two on the horizon are the Byron sweater by Natasha Hornby. Now that one's for Spencer. Uh, it's a beautiful men's sweater. I think it could you could go either way with it. It's designed, I think, as a men's sweater, but I think anyone could wear it. Yeah, it's a beautiful broken, broken seed stitch, if I'm trying to remember right, uh, for the majority of the body with some striping, you know, contrast color striping going on kind of up here in the yoke. So Spencer picked it out. We picked out some yarn from um, New Zealand. So I'll talk about that one. And the other one is the Lunenberg pullover by Amy Christoffers, uh, which you've probably seen around. A lot of people have been making the Lunenberg pullover. Actually, a couple of people in my Zoom, Saturday Zoom group uh, have made it. So I'm looking forward to talking with them about it once I get going on the knitting. Uh, and so the planning for both of those has been pretty interesting. I'll start with the Lunenberg. Uh, so Lunenberg is, it's a beautiful sweater in the boho tradition, so that means, to me, that means that um, the yoke has not just knit stitches, but it has purl stitches in the color work. So the 
purl stitches really break up color work in some pretty interesting ways. And if you're interested in the boho st tradition, there's a bunch of essays out there. Um, if I'm remembering right, Kate Davies has done some work on that. Uh, I believe Fruity Knitting, Andrea, um, interviewed, who was it? Someone who does a lot of the boho tradition um, with Angora, if I'm remembering right. Uh, anyway, I'll try to put all those links in the comments so that you can catch up on that. Um, and that particular sweater has been interesting to plan because I've knit a sweater before in the boho tradition, so I know what it's like to knit with pearls in my color work. It's a little bit, it, it does some really interesting things. Actually, the sweater I was working on with that was Flight by Sarah Pope, and that one actually, I think I was using three colors for the color work at any one time, and I'm pretty sure Lunenburg only uses two colors, so that makes it a little bit simple. So with Lunenburg, uh, as with a lot of my sweater projects, I found the original, and you know, the original is beautiful, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to make it. Maybe you found a sweater that you like on Instagram, you saw someone else making something, and you're thinking to yourself, how do I do that? <laughs> like, where do I start? So of course, the first place to go is to look at the, if, you, if you're on Ravelry, or if you uh, have a designer who has another um, website out there, go check out what the pattern actually looks like. You don't have to download the pattern yet, but just go look at what the you know description looks like, the yarn that's suggested. Uh, if you're on Ravelry, you can see other people's projects. That's often where I start, uh, especially if I'm not crazy about the color combination in the original. So in this case, Lunenburg, uh, the original is gorgeous, but it's a little bit um, earthy for my taste. It's a lot of oranges and browns and kind of yellows. Not so good for my complexion, I don't think. I'm not, I'm not super great at wearing like yellows and browns. Um, so I was looking for something that was a little more jewel toned, my favorite colors, and I think they kind of look cool on me. Uh, I actually just feel good in them. These are the things that matter, right? <laughs> um, and I found a beautiful version of it um, that was featured on the designer's front page for the pattern. So I checked out, the next thing to do is to check out those project pages where you might find different color combinations or different tips or tricks. You might also find out on those pages that something's kind of funny with the pattern. Now that's not the case with the Lunenburg. Everybody that I've heard from has said it is a simple pattern to follow, beautiful, well-written, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but you might find out that people are having trouble with the pattern. Uh, you can kind of then start to discern if it's the pattern itself or if it was the knitter <laughs> who was having the problem. Um, but if you see that kind of happening throughout a lot of project pages, it might be a pattern to maybe stay away from depending on how you, how how you feel, how intrepid you feel about it. So I, uh, after doing that, I will often, if I've decided that I want to make the sweater, uh, but I've decided I want to make it in that alternate version, I'll check out what yarn that person has used, uh, because that might make a difference. If they've used a yarn from their stash or a yarn that's inaccessible to me, then it might not work out as well, and I might not end up going with that sweater project. So you can see there's a lot of like pre-sweater, <laughs> pre-sweater thinking that happens here. Now, the, the sweater version that I happened to find that I loved um, uses a different color combination. So it uses the lichen and lace, which is the original. The original sweater is ended up in lichen and lace. Uh, and the version that I found, the color version that I like, um, has a coal color for the background, the main color. And then instead of all of the totally earthy colors, she uh, uses a blue and a uh, kind of rosy color. So this is the total col color combination that will be in my yoke. Now I picked, I went through my stash because I have a lot of lichen and lace in my stash and I almost had the right uh, colors here. I had a little bit, I had uh, one of these that was a little bit more yellow and I had one of these that was a little bit more red. So it wasn't quite right. So I ended up ordering a little bit of yarn and using some yarn from my stash to get this kind of color combination. Um, so then the trick is, you gotta download the pattern, you've gotta look through the pattern and see what the deal is in terms of gauge and needles and you know trying to get yourself set up for, to succeed. And I've talked a lot on here about, um, or and in my classes, about how I read a pattern. Uh, and I actually have a free class up on YouTube right now uh, that's about how I read a sweater pattern. <laughs> so if you're interested in that part of the process, you can head, head over and check out those. I think there are five or six videos there. And once I've read the pattern and gotten everything set up, I'm looking at the gauge, right? I'm thinking to myself, do I need to knit a gauge swatch? Luckily for me, I've knit a couple different sweaters in Lichen and Lace, and so I know my gauge. I knit one sweater 
that turned out just slightly too big. It was a, an Isabel Kramer pattern and her patterns usually fit me really well. So I was kind of surprised. I just misjudged my gauge a little bit. Uh, and then the next sweater I knit was the Nasrin. And that's also, I knit it in lichen and lace. It's an Isabel Kramer pattern. And I adjusted my gauge based on the sweater that I had just knit. Nasrin turned out beautifully. Love it, gauge is perfect, size is perfect, everything's great. And this pattern, as it turns out, uses the same gauge <laughs> as the Nasrin sweater. It's 24 stitches to the to four inches, uh, which is what I was able to achieve with Nasrin on a different size needle than what's called for in the pattern. So I know without even knitting a gauge swatch that I'm gonna go with that other size needle, size two needle, and uh, this same yarn. So I will be able to get that same gauge most likely. So I'm not, I know, I know I can't believe I'm saying this. I'm not gonna knit a gauge swatch for this sweater. Uh, I'm just gonna roll with it and go for it because I have knit two other sweaters with the yarn in the same gauge one of them correctly, one of them not so correctly. <laughs> um, so I know that I'm good to go with a size two needle, pretty much. So that is the plan for this one. Now all I need to do is uh, wind up the yarn and you know do a little circling in the pattern and just whoosh, off I go. It's gonna be a fun, simple knit. But the thing is I promised Spencer that I'd knit him a sweater first. So <laughs> there you go, that is the Byron sweater. Uh, and like I said, the Byron sweater is a Natasha Hornby sweater. Uh, Natasha Hornby, I've, I've knit one of her, uh, I've knit a vest by her in uh, linen, which was beautiful, the pattern was really well done. So I'm not too worried about, you know, uh, the writing of a good pattern or anything like that. She's a well-known designer, does good work, everybody likes her patterns, they're wonderful. Uh, but Spencer and I didn't like, we have a couple things about his sweater. We didn't like the original color combination totally. Uh, and the original yarn. So we found a color combination in the original yarn that we liked, but the original yarn is held double and it's held with an alpaca yarn. Um, and Spencer runs really hot. So I'm always trying to knit for him in cotton or linen or hemp or something like that, or a blend so that it's a little bit lighter. Um, yeah, I couldn't find anything that I loved. So the cool thing was on the project pages, we did find a sweater color combination that he liked and it was knit out of just wool. It wasn't held double with alpaca. So at the very least, it will be a cooler wool sweater. Um, the yarn that was in that particular project came from New Zealand uh, and it was a Southlander Sport two ply. So this is one of the contrast colors, but I just wanted to show you the label. Uh, so this is a uh, New Zealand company, uh, Skeens, where I got this. Shipping, like I, I think I said this on one of the other podcasts, totally reasonable for a sweater quantity. And they packed this stuff down. So it was like uh, all the air was completely sucked out of these yarn uh, packages. So this stuff plumped up really well. I just wanted to show you, I think I talked about it in the last um, podcast, but I wanted to show you how plump the yarn came out of that uh, vacuum sealed package. <laughs> it's really beautiful, very soft, uh, super squishy. And when I pulled it out of the package, I could smell the lanolin, especially like under the label. It just smells a little bit like sheep. So I'm pretty happy with that, uh, with that yarn. Uh, and uh, because I followed the, the project pattern page on Ravelry and picked out the same yarn, uh, I was able to pick out the colors that I liked for that project and actually see what they'd look like knit up in a project. It's kind of important because this particular um, pattern calls for that broken seed stitch. And you can do the broken seed stitch in a couple different ways. She talks about that in the pattern. Um, but it's going to produce a really interesting fabric and you kind of want to have a sense of what your colors are going to look like ahead of time. So this is my swatch. I did swatch. It's how I plan for sweaters that I've never knit with. If I've not knit with the yarn, I've got a swatch. If I've not knit with the yarn with certain needles, I've got a swatch. Uh, so this is my swatch and I think the camera will pick up on this broken seed stitch. I'm hoping. Uh, I'm using the blue as my main color and I'm using the green as my background color. And I really absolutely love the way this looks. So this is the main fabric of his sweater. It'll look just like that. So it'll have a kind of like, it's a striped pattern, but because of the broken seed stitch, it looks almost like you've got diagonals going on. It looks more complicated than it is. This, this is really <laughs> a very, one of those stitches that just is a very simple stitch, but it looks really cool in, you know, fabric form. So the broken seed stitch with both of these colors. Now, the other tricky thing. 
since we're talking about how I plan my sweaters, is that my gauge for this swatch is not Natasha Hornby, Hornby's gauge. That I did swatch in the round because this is color work, easier to swatch in the round, and I just wanted to get a full sense of what it would look like, um, you know, if I was actually knitting that way to get a better, more accurate gauge swatch since this is kind of a, an all over textured sweater, important when you're planning a sweater. So my gauge is about two stitches more for every four inches than hers. If your gauge is off, you can often take that size that you'd be going for and multiply by your own gauge and fi then find a size up or a size down in the pattern that will kind of work pretty closely. Yeah, not so much with this. <laughs> so I was a little disappointed the other night. I actually broke out the ruler, did my gauge on my swatch, and it was just not and I did the math and it's just not one of those patterns where I can just go up or down very easily. So in sweater planning land, that means a good, probably a couple of hours in the morning when I'm very fresh, uh, spent working with the pattern and going to kind of, I, I talk about this in one of my classes, but um, the mod, one of the modification classes, uh, but basically going to the pattern at key moments and finding out what the stitch counts are looking at how the, it's a top-down sweater, looking at how the increases are distributed for the yoke and then for the sleeves, seeing how much wiggle room I have, um, and then probably designing my own size, <laughs> which is not always the easiest thing to do. Um, ideally, if you're, especially if you're new to sweater knitting and your gauge isn't coming out just right and you want to go, be able to go just up a size or down a size, find a pattern that that works for if you're going to try that for the first time um, rather than what I'm going to be doing, which is pretty much designing a sweater. Um, one of the reasons that I'm doing that is that I really like the fabric I'm getting at this gauge. So it's a little bit airier than I would normally go with. I think you can see that. Normally, if I could kind of like push through a little bit and see through the fabric like that, I would probably try to make it more dense, um, which is actually the opposite of what I need to do to get her um, gauge. To get her gauge, I'd need to make this less dense, so fewer stitches um, for the size per inch, and I'm not really into that. So I like this gauge, and it's the gauge I really want to go with, so I'm going to have to design the sweater around it. This just that's Sometimes that's just what happens. But you have to go through, a, you can see I've gone through a lot of processing <laughs> before ever getting to that point. Nothing is cast on yet for either of these sweaters but it's taken a lot of planning to get to that point. So if the question is, how do I plan my sweaters? I do a lot of work ahead of time. And usually that is a way to, usually it ensures that the sweater that you come away with is gonna work out a little bit better. So if you don't put in the time right at the beginning to actually think through this, think about color, think about yarn, think about gauge, it works sometimes. Sometimes you can be really pleasantly surprised. I'm not saying it doesn't work. Uh, but you're more apt, you're more likely to get a sweater that you're happy with if you've done that kind of prep work ahead of time. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. I haven't cast on either of these yet. Uh, plus it's the end of the semester, like I mentioned. I'm also writing a new book, which is kind of like <laughs> taking up a lot of my mental space right now. So I've been working instead uh, of doing the funny math for that sweater, which I feel like I need to knit first for Spencer. Uh, I've been working on my blanket, which is the, it's called Long Story Short, but I've changed the whole thing, basically. Uh, and it's going well. I've actually cleaned out most of my, it's a scrappy blanket. I've cleaned out a lot of my, all my scraps, I think, for superwash yarn. I've actually opened whole skeins of superwash yarn at this point. Uh, and now I'm starting to cannibalize other things. So I had, uh, some of you may remember that I was working on a version of the North Easterly blanket, northwesterly, uh, one or the other, um, which are these strips. They're beautiful. They're beautiful strips. It was it was an interesting project. I just didn't feel like knitting strips and working on the bias. It just it wasn't working for me. Um, so I have a couple of these strips left, and I'm kind of thinking I'm going to cannibalize them for the scrappy blanket. Though maybe I'll just you know it's kind of one of those things where it's already knit. It's knit fabric. It's pretty. It could be kind of scarfy. I don't know. You could, you could use it for something. <laughs> Sometimes when things are knit, I'm just like, why bother taking it apart? So I'm torn right now whether or not this yarn uh, will go into my scrappy blanket or not. Uh, but it is kind of hanging around here. 
and the scrappy blanket is so close to being done. I think I am maybe about 230 rows from being finished because right now the blanket is decreasing on each side at each row so it's getting smaller and smaller and going to that last corner. So that'll be done soon, I hope. Yeah. Anyway, it's gotten me through a lot of Zoom meetings <laughs> in the last couple of weeks. So that's how I plan my sweaters and that's why sometimes it takes a long time to get to a point of actually having a sweater on the needles and why I'm working on my blanket. Uh, the other thing that I promised is I'd talk a little bit about care and mending of sweaters. So um, this last week, like I said, I pulled a bunch of sweaters that I've been wearing out of my closet and the first thing I always look for are like holes, where do they need to be mended, you know, wear and tear, all that stuff. This guy, we'll pull this over if I can. Come closer, my dear. So this guy um, is Alias by Isabel Kramer, and it's one of my two Alias sweaters. The other one is actually in the wash right now, <laughs> and it's the deeper purple one. Uh, and these sweaters, I think because I went with long, longish sleeves, they kind of hang down over my wrists a little bit. Whenever I'm working at the computer, they always catch, and that wear and tear eventually um, pokes holes in my the bottoms of my cuffs here. So one of the things I have to do, I think it's every year, every couple years, is mend the cuffs on these, these sweaters. So this year, I think I only needed to mend one um, extensively and the other just in a minor way. Yeah, that's what happened. So I have some footage. I took some footage of uh, the mending process. And with this particular sweater, what you'll see is uh, that Sometimes when I mend sweaters, I take them down to, you know, you kind of identify where the problem is. Maybe you pull the yarn all the way back, the pattern all the way back to a place where there's some stability with the yarn, and then you actually re-knit. And, and that's what happens with this particular cuff. Um, these are knit top down. So I had a uh, kind of like, it was all worn out here at the top, and or at the very bottom. And so what I did is identified where the last most stable part of the yarn was, pulled everything back, pulled everything out, took out the, cat, the yeah, bind off, pulled everything back to a place of stability, put those stitches on my needles, and then added new yarn in. And, and for many, many of you know, I keep a sweater stash yarn bin. Like if I've knit a sweater, I try to keep a little bit of the yarn uh, for mending and things like that. So this um, particular one, I did need to re-knit about three or four rows it was about two, it was two or three rows plus the bind off again. And you can barely see it. I'm not sure if the camera will pick it up, but I think you'll be able to see it in the other video. The yarn here that's been added for the mending is a slightly different color. It's the same yarn, uh, but it's a slightly different color because, you know, when you wear a sweater, it fades a little bit in the sunshine or just in the wear and tear or when you've washed it, all that kind of stuff. So these mends will look a little bit more pink, <laughs> kind of like bright fleshy color. Uh, until they kind of wear into the sweater, like the rest of the sweater. This sweater, as some of you may recall, I keep saying that a lot on this particular episode, but as some of you may recall, the dogs got a hold of this sweater a long time ago when they were puppies and ripped the button band in a couple different places, actually crunched a couple of the buttons. And I repaired it, and the button band is, is added on, um, you know, to this sweater, what is this horizontally? I'm really having some trouble with my directions today. You pick up stitches and you knit this way, yes, horizontally. Uh, so I did that maybe a year or two ago, same thing with the yarn that I had saved. And you can't see any of that now. The color is all exactly the same. I had to change the buttons because the buttons got crunched, you know. Um, but the color of this particular button band has just mellowed just like everything else. Uh, and that's what will happen with the, the cuff here. Now, the other kind of mending that I will sometimes do if I don't really feel like pulling everything back and, you know, messing with it and making sure I'm in stitch, you know, in the right pattern and all that kind of stuff, because you can see that this sleeve does have a little faux cable running down it. Uh, in this case right here, all I did was go in and do a little patch. So it's not as pretty and it's not as like perfectly mended, but it's just a little patch I don't think you could actually see it from a distance. It's a little bit of a lump here. Um, and you can see on the inside, it's not perfect right here. If you were really looking, you'd be like, oh, what happened there? 
Um, but the thing is, it was a very, very tiny worn spot and these sleeves, these sleeve cuffs always wear out. So I just assume it's going to wear out again next year. And when it really wears out, then I'll pull it back just like I did with this one and actually do, you know, re-knit the sleeve down for now. Just doing a little mend right here. As long as it's as pretty clean on the front, you know, no matter what you have to do on the back, no one's going to really notice it. So. So that mending happened. I also had a sweater with a hole in the armpit. Ugh, oh, I know. Holes in the armpits. Awful, awful things. I found that I had actually dropped a stitch. I had been wearing the sweater for a long time and it was 100% wool, so that stitch just sat there. <laughs> just, but there was a hole. Um, so all I had to do was identify the little stitch and grab it and then on the inside, it turns out that I already had a little piece of yarn there that I hadn't woven in an end. Who, like, what was I thinking? Uh, so I just used that to do the mend. Uh, I kind of like worked the yarn tail over to the point where there was a little hole in the loose stitch, got it all bound up together, and it's not absolutely perfect, of course, because it's a mend as opposed to a knit. So that's just a quick peek into how I mend and repair my sweaters. I do it at the end of every winter season. Make sure that you get your sweaters out, mend them, wash them before you put them away because it turns out moths, they like the wool, sure, but what they're really attracted to is like any food or like oils or like skin cells, things like that. So it's good to wash your woolens, put them away so that they're all ready for you in the next season. So that's all I have for today, except for a little bit of business. Uh, just a quick update that my destash page over on knittingthestash.com is still being updated. I am still destashing things. All lovely, wonderful yarn. Um, I just am not using it, so it needs to go to a good home. So if you go to the main page and hover over more on the top bar, you'll see destash pop up, and that's where I keep my destash listings. Uh, and then the other thing is our flock farm yarn cal has ended. Now this was uh, for anyone who wanted to knit a garment out of a flock farm yarn. And it was amazing to see so many of you um, put together sweaters. I was just really, really happy. A lot of you did them with Shorn 4, uh, which was just really exciting to see. So thank you so much for participating in the cal. The Grand prize winner is Mary. Uh, she put together a vest out of Shorn 4, and then there were a couple of other yarn prize winners, and that was Rose and uh, Megan. So you've all been notified. Uh, send me your info, either your email addresses or your mailing addresses, and I will get those prizes in the mail to you. Thanks so much to everyone who participated in the cow. Uh, and with that, I think I'm going to go relax for once in a weekend because we're not planting trees <laughs> or raspberries or anything else. Uh, though I will say we got all 400 trees in the ground and all 20 raspberries planted and I will give you a little footage of that here at the end. Uh, I hope you have something fun in store for yourself this weekend and otherwise I will see you in a couple weeks with the next podcast. Take care everybody. Bye-bye.